Hello, welcome everybody to Davis Park Church of Christ uh, YouTube, uh, Facebook live stream, and we want we want to welcome you to our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, before we get into Bible study, uh, uh, we will go into a few requests, and af after we're done with our requests, you'll probably hear a song, and then you will hear Nick. Perez uh, speaking on his lesson on tonight. Uh, at this time, um, we want to recognize a few requests. Um, Kim Perez, uh, 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 I uh, want, want to pray for Hunter, a second grade who attends Woodrow. Uh, he, he's a Woodrow student here in Modesto. He was hit by a car and is recovering from surgery at this time. Uh, we also want to recognize Lou Wade's brother-in-law, Ray, having, uh, having emergency heart surgery this week. Uh, want to continue to pray for Sh Sheila Walls for uh, strength to keep moving forward, seeing positive changes, having less pain. And then our sister uh, Helen Pot Potterf, She's 90 years old and is having health issues. I want to keep her in prayer as well. Uh, Gary Laguna's, uh, Vic, Vicky's mom, mom's cousin attempted suicide. She was 27 years old, this is a 27 year old niece. Her name is Lauren, uh, has been diagnosed with MS and will begin treatment soon. So we definitely want to pray for Lauren. Uh, Yuri Gomez's boyfriend, Nick Phillips, is having health issues. We want to keep him in prayer. Uh, Susan Brown's co-worker's father, uh, father's kidneys are failing. Uh, he is recovering from surgery, so we want to pray uh, on behalf of his kidney health and the recovery of his surgery. Uh, <clears throat> we also want to keep praying for Brother Max Allen, uh, who's still recovering from open surgery heart surgery, and we want to keep praying for Eric Waller's dad, Carl, whose ribs were fractured and his shoulder blades partially collapsed, lungs and all of that stuff. So he had a few things that we want to continue to pray about. Uh, I want to keep praying for David Testado, who's recovering from his neck surgery. Uh, Brianna Richmond's grandmother is still losing blood. Uh, cause is still unknown, so let's continue to pray for answers for her and, and healing for her. Uh, we also want to pray on behalf of uh, Terry and Tracy. Uh, Tracy's son, Dallin, undergoing treatment for his brain cancer. We want to pray uh, the best possible outcome for him. And we also want to pray for uh, Terry's daughter, Katie, Lynn, who has relapsed into her addiction and is in rehab. And we want to continue to keep Clementina Robles in, in prayer for cancer. And as far as the coronavirus, we've had some who've dropped off. Uh, 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 Brother Walls, uh, 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 Aunt Dorothy has dropped off of the list. And uh, also, uh, we want to keep in mind um, uh, Brianna Richmond, uh, aunt, aunt's fiance, is di diagnosed with COVID, and we want to keep in uh, mind um, of, of uh, um, man, I blanked out. Uh, we just want to keep all of our coronavirus uh, victims who are still recovering and who have gotten better treatment. We we want to. Pray that they will progress in uh, better health at this time. Let us go to God in prayer. Holy Father, we thank you once again for an opportunity to come to you in prayer. We know, Father, you you are so approachable uh, that you you welcome us to you, even though we are sinners and we know that we don't deserve to be be able to approach you. you. You're such a loving God and such a caring God that uh, you provide purification in such a way through your son 
so that our sins might not be seen by you. We thank you, Father, for that gift. We thank you for paying the cost that we couldn't pay. And we come before you, Father, on many requests that have been made. And we pray, Father, that uh, we ask, Father, that you will continue to grant them uh, what they stand in need of. Uh, display your power in their lives so that they can truly know that it is you that made the difference in their life. We pray on behalf of Kim's request concerning Hunter, who got hit. We pray, Father, that you will continue to bless him, that he will recover from his surgery. Uh, we, we pray, Father, that it will be an easy transition to cover, to, for him to recover uh, from his surgery and that uh, he will have a speedy recovery and be able to be active again as he wishes. We pray for the family on his behalf as well who, who are concerned about him. We ask, Father, that you will continue to watch over uh, Brother Wade's brother-in-law, Ray, uh, who is having emergency heart surgery this week. Father, we know that that simply means something has been detected and it can't wait any longer. And we pray, Father, that uh, your, your timing will be there for him to be, to, to, to be uh, we pray for the, the procedure to go well for him, and we pray, Father, that uh, the doctors will take proper care to know all, all that they need to know and be will, ready to do all that they need to do to uh, work toward his healing and his recovery. And we pray, Father, that your, your presence will be there with him to ensure that, Father. We pray on behalf of Sister Walls, who is, who is thankful, Father, for what you have done for her so far. And she, want, she requests, Father, continued prayers for strength and encouragement. And we pray, Father, that you will help uh, limit her pains that she's dealing with. And help, Lord, continue to help her to see positive change as she desires to see the changes. Sometimes it's, it's hard, Father, because we, we, we trust our eyes a lot and we, we trust what we see. And it's hard to, 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 to trust by faith sometimes. And we know, Father, that we're human, and, and that is no excuse one way or another, but we know, Father, that we are who we are, and we do what we do, and we know that you understand our hearts, Father. And we thank you for your patience in spite of that. And we ask, Father, on her behalf, you will grant her what she stands in need of. Father, we pray also on behalf of uh, Helen, uh, Potter, who's 90 years old, she's having health issues. It's not known what specific issues they are, but she's having some kind of challenge. And we know, Father, that uh, with age, uh, there's a tendency to, uh, ha uh, health has a tendency to be a greater challenge at that age. And we, we just pray, Father, that your presence be there for her and to meet her every need, whatever they are. We pray also, Father, on behalf of Vicky's mom's cousin who attempted suicide. We, we, she's 27 years old, Father. I don't know. I, we, I understand, Father, sometimes conditions uh, may cause you not to want to deal with them, to deal with the reality of them. But, Father, we, we want her to understand that if your presence is there, you're more than enough for her. And we pray, Father, that she will come to realize that you love her so much that you can heal her of this and that you, your presence is there to meet her every need. If she has to go through this, Father, we know, Father, that you can make her circumstances and her, her life uh, able to go through this and do it successfully. So we pray that whatever, Father, your approach is going to be, we know, Father, it's enough. We know that it's more than enough. So we ask, Father, that you will give her that confidence so that she will not make any more attempts on her own life. She needs to understand, Father, that you sent, her son, you sent your son for her and that she, she's worth that much. So we pray, Father, that she will give faith in you a chance and, and not give up on her life, Father. We also ask, Father, that you will watch over Yuri's boyfriend, Nick Phillips, who is having health issues. We don't know what they are, 
We know that you're pre we know that you presently know what they are, Father, and we know that you know how to address them. So we pray, Father, for the best possible outcome on his behalf, that you watch over his health and and help him to be responsible for his 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 actions as it relates to his own health as well, Father. Because I know, Father, that we're all responsible for the decisions we make in our health circumstances. Sometimes we overwork. Sometimes we're doing too much and we're neglecting the things that are simple. So we ask, Father, that you will help him to do his part in, in, uh, in partnering in his own well-being. We pray, Father, that you will continue to watch over Susan Brown's co-worker's father. His kidneys are failing and he is recovering from surgery. So we ask, Father, that whatever the issue is with his kidneys, we know, Father, that it's not too hard. We know, Father, that you're far capable. Uh, you have all power in your hand and you have it all in your word. So all you got to do is speak and things will change. So we ask, Father, that you will watch over him at this time over, over all his needs. And we ask that you will continue to help him to recover through his surgery. We ask also on behalf of Max Allen that you will watch over his recovering uh, process. And we pray, Father, that uh, you watch over him and his wife as they strive together to help him to recover more quickly. And we pray, Father, that he will comply with what's, what's needed in order for that to happen. We also, Father, ask that you continue to watch over Carl uh, in ICU still. And we ask, Father, that you will help his, his fractured ribs to heal and his shoulder blades and, and all of his his lung issues father we pray father that you will continue to watch over him and help him to recover and heal as he stands in need we ask father that you watch over uh brother david testato that he will continue to uh, uh develop recovery on his on his neck and we pray father that that happens uh quickly and and sufficiently so that he can be active again we also ask, Father, that you will watch over Brianna's grandmother who's losing blood still. And we pray, Father, that you will. We, we know, Father, that the cause is already known to you. You know, you know how to address it. And we ask, Father, that you will continue to bless us, that we will be patient with your process. And we know, Father, that your ways are right. And you, everything that you do, you do with, your, with an eternal purpose in mind. So we ask, Father, that you will help us to remember to just trust you, even if we don't understand the circumstances. We ask, Father, that you will continue to watch over Tracy's son, Dallin, who's undergoing treatment for brain cancer. It, it is unfortunate that this young man is going through these issues. And we ask, Father, that you will have mercy on his soul and mercy on his health. We ask that you will continue to provide solutions that will help uh, to turn this around so that Tracy will truly see you for who you are. We ask, Father, that you will watch over Terry's daughter, Katie, that she will continue to uh, overcome her addiction. We pray, Father, that uh, you, will, you will disempower the lie and the deception that causes her to desire to be addicted. And we ask, Father, that you will take that away. Uh, if not, Father, we pray that you will give her the strength and the understanding by your truth to want to stop. So we ask for, for this in any way you see fit, Father. We pray that the lie that causes that desire will be disempowered. We ask, Father, that you also watch over Clementina. We, you know, in talking to her family, she's been having some good days. And we pray, Father, that that will continue to progress. We ask, Father, that you will continue to heal her and recover her. We know that you can. And we, we pray for her. We love her dearly. And she's such a sweet woman. And she loves to be involved in, in, in some of the cooking and, and, and the things that we have in fellowships together. So we thank you, Father, for her service. And we ask, Father, that you will continue to watch over her, her, her health and her well-being. We ask, Father, that you will continue to watch over Brianna's aunt aunt's fiance that was diagnosed with COVID. We pray, Father, that you will continue to work with him and that, that he will be healed of this particular virus and however it's affecting his health. And we pray, Father, that he will be responsible as well
take responsibility in his recovery as well. We ask you, Father, we want to thank you for all of these, these requests. We know, Father, that you can, you can neutralize any of these. You can heal. You can cause us to adjust to whatever we need to. Whatever the case, Father, your will be done. We ask, Father, that you will continue to watch over us and guide us. And, and we ask, Father, for all of those who have requests that are on other lists uh, that still pertains to this congregation and family members they're concerned about, we pray for all of them, and we pray for all of those who are still at the front line dealing with COVID and all of these things, Father. As things are opening up, we pray for the safety of our lands. We pray, Father, that you will help us to take better responsibility and be safer with how we open up our businesses and do our services. We thank you for all of this, and we ask you this in your son's name we pray. Amen. You want to grab your Bible and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Sunday we talked about how Christ on the cross in John's gospel as it's presented is Jesus confronting and defeating the devil who stands in place as head of the cosmic spiritual forces of darkness. And I told you that tonight, we are going to talk about what does that look like? How does that show up? And specifically, if Christ has won the victory, why are we still fighting? And, by extension, how are we supposed to fight? 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I want us to read verses 1 through 6. <clears throat> I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold towards you when I am away. I beg you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. <clears throat> Father, help us to see clearly how we can apply Christ's victory to our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So why do we struggle? Why are we still fighting? Why do we have negative thoughts? Why are we still struggling with, with sin? Why am I depressed or anxious about anything? Why? I think perhaps part of the reason that we still struggle with sin and shame and negative self-talk is that while on the one hand we have accepted the personal benefits of Christ's work on the cross, things like salvation and forgiveness and redemption and, and all that, and rightly so because he did secure those on the cross, <clears throat> while we accept those personal benefits, I think on the other hand, we have yet to accept, acknowledge and accept the benefits of Christ's cross on a cosmic level. That is to say, we believe Christ has forgiven us, that he has saved us, that he has redeemed us. We are saved by the cross. And that's right. However, do we believe, really believe, that on the cross, Christ also defeated the cosmic forces of evil which terrorize us in the spiritual realm. <clears throat> One thing that can happen is, is when we centralize our personal relationship with Christ and thereby personalize the benefits of a substitutionary atonement on the cross, I think one thing that can happen is we can minimize or perhaps even miss the cosmic benefits of Christ's death on the cross. And more than that, 
when we confuse the primary benefit of Christ's atoning death as saving me or rescuing me or you, we actually confuse the primary emphasis found in Scripture placed on Christ's death on the cross. What I mean is, the emphasis in Scripture is on Christ's defeat of the cosmic spiritual powers of evil. But what we do is we emphasize instead what he did for me. Even how we talk about Christ's death, I think, reflects kind of an anthropocentric, an individualistic view of the atonement. For example, you may have heard a preacher in the past preach or teach something along the lines of, you know, if, if you were the only sinner, if you were the only one who had ever sinned, Christ still would have come and died just for you. Do you hear how individualistic that is? How focused on me that is? And look, that, that, I have no problem with that. I, that's, that seems like gospel. Be that as it may, Christ's coming in crucifixion, well, again, it does secure those individual benefits. Not saying it doesn't. The primary emphasis, even if Jesus came just for you or just for me, the primary emphasis would still be on his triumph over Satan and sin and disarming the rulers and principalities. That would still be the emphasis, even if he came and died just for me or just for you. And that's important because, again, the New Testament's emphasis, all you New Testament Christians out there, say amen in the chat. The New Testament's emphasis concerning the cross is Christ's defeat of these cosmic spiritual forces for the redemption of not just you and me, humans, but for the whole universe. Don't take my word for it. Listen to Paul in Colossians 1, verses 19 and 20. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell bodily, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, and all things would include you and me, all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. There's the substitutionary atonement of Christ on the cross right there. Greg Boyd has written a book called God at War, and he points out, and I quote, Christ's achievement on the cross is first and foremost a cosmic event. It defeats Satan. And framed in this way, then the personal benefits that accrue to us, to you and me, as a result of the cross, those are caught up in Christ's complete victory over Satan, sin, and death, and all that. Again, to cite Boyd, the, significant of, the significance of Christ's work on the cross far outruns what it accomplishes for human beings. And that's the truth. The cosmic significance of the work of Christ on the cross can actually be seen in the very first prophecy of a coming Messiah who would deal with Satan. Genesis 3.15, the very first promise, the very first prophecy of someone coming to deal with Satan. It talks about how he would come and crush the head of Satan. That should show us, at least by virtue of the fact that it's first, that Christ's death on the cross has this cosmic significance. So, on the cross, what's Jesus doing? Christ is putting his boot on Satan's head, and in principle, he is crushing his head. And then by extension, Christians who are in Christ, who presently live in, it's sometimes called the in-between, sometimes people talk about it as the already not yet, we will one day fully realize the experience of Christ's full crushing, and we'll actually participate in that as well at Christ's second coming. Again, listen to Paul. He, he speaks to the rights of the Christians in Rome, in Romans chapter 16 and verse 20. And he says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet, Christians' feet. And so, in principle, Christ 
defeats completely and totally, crushes the head of Satan and all his forces, and then we'll realize it fully and finally one day at his second coming when we too will crush him under our feet. So again, we circle back to where we began. Fine, I hear that. One thing we need to do then in order to apply Christ's uh, atonement, his victory to our lives, is, in the first place, we need to acknowledge the reality. We need to acknowledge that this is a real thing. And I think one thing, we're, a rest, we're part of the restoration movement, right? We need to restore the primacy, the primary place of Christ's work on the cross as being, first and foremost, that cosmic event, the defeat of Satan and all the spiritual forces, which brings us back to 2 Corinthians 10. Okay, what's Paul doing here? Let's just walk through the text. I, Paul, myself entreat you, by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold towards you when I am away. You hear what he's doing here. First and foremost, Paul, his entreaty, it begins with Christ. It is the meekness, it is the gentleness of Christ, not of Paul. Paul gets himself out of the picture, takes himself out of the spotlight and puts Christ in the spotlight. It is Christ's meekness and gentleness that he appeals to his Corinthian siblings with. Again, it's not his authority, it's Christ's authority that he appeals to. By the way, I'm, I'm humble when I'm face to face. This is what his opponents are saying. And we're going to look at his opponents in more detail in just a moment. But his opponents are like, well, yeah, you know, here's Paul, I mean... Can you really trust that guy? I mean, yeah, he's super humble when he's here face to face. But in the letter, he's so boisterous and outspoken. Ah, You don't want to listen to Paul. You want to listen to us. That's what 2 Corinthians is all about. Paul having to defend his apostleship and having to come and go heads up with these, he calls them false apostles, super apostles. He calls them uh, even... Uh, those who disguise themselves in righteousness. They don't really have righteousness. They don't really want righteousness. They're, they're the hypocrites. And so verse 2, I beg of you that when I am present, I, am not, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. And the some here, those are his opponents, Paul's human opponents that have been slandering Paul to the Corinthians. They have been defaming his character, running him down, trying to ruin his reputation with the Corinthian church. And these human opponents, later on, I mentioned, he's going to classify them as false apostles, deceitful workmen, chapter 11, verse 13. They disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, verse 15 of chapter 11 talks about. But really, they're in league with Satan because Satan, he disguises himself as an angel of light, 11, verse 14. And so... With that as the backdrop, now you see the veil is pulled back by Paul. He pulls the veil back. He shows us the battle. It is not between people. The interpersonal conflict Paul may be having with these false apostles, super apostles, Paul's showing us it's not really about them. There is more than meets the eye when it comes to that conflict that's happening here between him and these super apostles. It is, the conflict is spiritual in nature. In other words, it's not about the other guy. It's not even about Paul, per se. It's something happening in the spiritual realm. And man, that is instructive for us. Because I don't know about you, sometimes I get into interpersonal conflict with people. I'm sure that probably doesn't characterize you. Yeah, right. It's not about the other person. It's not even about you. About me? I, it's never about me. I never raise conflict with you. Yeah, okay. Listen. It's not about us. There's some, who, who wants to sow discord and division among brethren? Who but Satan and his, his minions with him? That's where the battle really lies. That's what the conflict is all about. So, verse 3, 4, Though we walk in the flesh, though we are human, we are not waging war according to the flesh or according to human standards, your translation may say. And here is the crucial distinction that Paul makes. He is not just being cantankerous with people. Your conflict that you may have with sister cantankerous or brother curmudgeon, it's not about them. It's not about you. Paul 
he is explaining, look, there's a war going on, and he is warring against spiritual powers. We are humans. We live as humans. That's what Paul is saying here with we walk in the flesh. But our war, the war that we wage, it's not with humans. And we don't wage as, as humans do. Paul cuts right to the quick and he says there's something in back of these false apostles, these super apostles. And that's where the conflict really lies. Four, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. By the way, don't miss that. Weapons of our warfare. Do you hear it? That means not only Paul, he's not only talking about himself, He's also including his readers in this. And he's also including subsequent generations of Christians throughout church history all the way down to today. Yeah, the war continues. And we are a part of it. But it's not of the flesh. And that's an echo of uh, what he says over in Ephesians 6. Not not against flesh and blood, right? So the warfare then is spiritual. And therefore, the weapons of our warfare are spiritual as well. And he says here, they do not... Uh, But they have divine power to destroy strongholds. That divine power. Or God empowers the weapons. Or maybe it's God empowers us to wield the weapons. The New English translation puts it this way. The weapons are made powerful by God. And I like that. Yeah, that's, again, it gets the emphasis off of us. We get out of the spotlight. And God is in the spotlight. Listen, if you go out there and you try to wage spiritual warfare like some kind of spiritual Chuck Norris or spiritual Rambo, you will fail, you will fall flat on your face. Because here's what you're up against. Ready? You are up against powerful spiritual entities who have been at this game a lot longer than you've been alive. They've been at this for millennia. And you're going to go out there and try to wage war on your own against these guys? No, that would be foolish. Instead, we need the power of God behind us. Because only God, the Ancient of Days, only He is more powerful. Only He is wiser to outmaneuver and outstrategy the devil and the spiritual forces of darkness. We destroy, therefore, we destroy arguments. Listen, verse 5 is going to tell you where the battlefield is. Ready? We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Best I can tell, there are four terms in here. Arguments, or your translation may say speculations. That's good too. Lofty opinion, knowledge, and thoughts. These are all words that signal where the battle is. These are all words that communicate and deal with the mind. The battlefield is your mind. The battlefield is your mind. My mind. It's in the mind. And your mind is more than just The chemicals and the neurons and the synapses that are firing. You are more than a material machine. You are a spiritual creature. And so, the mind. That's where the battlefield is. And the challenge then is to take every thought captive to obey Christ. That's the challenge. You want to know God? You want to love Him with all of your mind? Obey Christ. You see, we come to know God when we obey Christ. That obedience, again, it starts in the mind. Every thought captive to obey Christ, ready to punish every disobedience and your, when your obedience is complete. Here, here's what I'm, what I'm after. Applying Christ's victory to your life, to my life. It shows you here in the text, the battle is for the mind. And Satan, I've talked before about Uh, some of his tactics. He wants to sit on the throne of your heart. Sit is an acronym. Suggestions, ideas, thoughts. It's a battlefield for the mind, right? So how's he going to get there? He has three main strategies that he will utilize. Temptation. Uh, We're pretty familiar with that. A lot can be said about it. Eh, That's not what I'm after right now. Deception. He's the great deceiver. He's the liar. We looked at John 8, verse 44 about this on Sunday. A lot can be said about deception. Not what I'm after today. Accusation. And this is what I want tonight. Accusation. He is the accuser of the brethren. You know what his name means? Satan, right? It means accuser. And I want to draw your attention to accusation because I think there are many people, even many Christians, this is what you are experiencing 
even right now, as you live under global pandemic, stay-at-home orders and all that, you're experiencing the attacks of the evil one and his forces that come by accusation. What does it sound like? I think we all have that, uh, that internal dialogue that goes on in our own minds that, that pe- other people aren't privy to, right? You know, oh man, I, I got to remember to pick up eggs. I got to remember, where did I put my keys? You know, I did, where did the, where's the remote? Man, I got to remember to go and pick up so-and-so down at wherever. And I got to, man, I, I was just thinking about this person the other day. And then they called me out of the, right? We have that internal dialogue that goes on. I think we all have that, right? Just, your cognition. And then there's metacognition where you think about your thinking. Why did I think? Sometimes that inner dialogue takes a hard right turn. And maybe it sounds something like this. We start thinking, man, I'm so dumb. Or, man, I can't, I just, I can't do that. Or, you know, I'm no good. Here's a big one. God, God doesn't love me. Man, where, where did that come from? It's true. Sometimes that voice is from without. It comes from other people. Many times it comes from within. In our own thought life, our own thought patterns. Let me just ask, those kinds of thoughts, does that sound like victory in Jesus? Or does that sound more like subjection to defeat? And and here's the thing. If we start believing those accusations, we'll live a defeated life. Satan, I think his primary goal is to try and make us evil. But if he can't make us evil, well, maybe I can get him to live in such a way that they live a defeated life. We are called in Scripture to spread the gospel. Not a lot of gospel in a defeated life. And that's where Satan, listen, Satan, he can't do anything about the fact that Christ has defeated him on the cross. He is fighting a losing war. Nothing Satan can do about that. And if we are living a faithful life, there's not a thing Satan can do about our position in Christ. We looked at 1 John chapter 5 and verse 18 on Sunday about how the evil one can't touch him, can't lay a finger on you in Christ. So Satan can't do anything about those things. But if he can successfully get us to believe that somehow in we are not fully complete in Christ, then we will live lives that reflect how we believe we aren't really complete in Christ. And I believe that is what Satan wants to do. If Again, if he can't make us evil, he's never going to overthrow Christ and his kingdom. Maybe I can get him to live a defeated life. And since the battle is for our mind, well... If I can get them thinking the wrong thoughts. If I can accuse them enough. And they start believing those accusations. And then here's one thought I had. Maybe you've wondered about this too. Well, gee, if the battle is for the mind, can the devil, and that's shorthand, by the way, for uh, these evil spiritual entities, can the devil read my mind? Can he read my thoughts? Even then we can back up and ask the question, well, wait a minute, Uh, does God know my thoughts? And look, there, there are literally dozens of verses in our Bible, Old Testament and New, that I can put my finger on that clearly teach that God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit know our thoughts. That seems to be a characteristic, an attribute of deity. However, there is nothing in the Bible that teaches, one way or the other, that the devil can or cannot read our thoughts. I... I I've read this book cover to cover multiple times. And I can't put my finger on a verse that says one way or another definitively, oh, he can read our thoughts. Or no, he can't read our thoughts. I can get close by inference or implication or what have you. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 11. One text that might teach that he's not able to. 1 Corinthians 2.11 says, For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. I often use this text in uh, marital counseling. Couples come to me and, 
And I use it to teach, look, your spouse cannot read your thoughts. You guys can't read one another's thoughts because who knows the person's thoughts except the spirit of the person that's within them, right? The only way that uh, a person can know what another person is thinking is if we tell them. And I believe the same principle is true for all creatures, human and angelic. Good, bad, or otherwise, right? No creature can read another creature's thoughts. No human can read another human's thoughts. No angel can read another angel's thoughts. And no angel can read a human's thoughts. No human can read an angel's thoughts. There, I think that covered all of them, right? They can't read our thoughts. I think that's about as close as I can get to making some kind of definitive statement about can they read our thoughts. I don't think they can. But at the same time, as I mentioned, these evil angelic entities, these are ancient creatures. They've been around a long time. They've seen generations of humans come, generations of humans go. They have studied humans, and they can probably determine patterns in human behavior and human thoughts. It's kind of like, I know some of you are, are fans of the, the television show, America's Got Talent. Every now and again, they have an illusionist come on there, a mentalist, something like that. They'll use numbers or sequences of pictures or something and you know you got to go up to and then over and then whatever right you to add three and then subtract by and then divide by whatever right and and they what they're doing is they're getting you to a certain solution through a certain predetermined highly structured sequence but again the solution has been predetermined and maybe that's kind of what it's like the, the mentalist the, they can't really read your mind and I think in a similar way, these evil, ancient, angelic entities are kind of like that. That given a certain set of circumstances, if A, then B, maybe C, they can so structure events and circumstances that in a given situation, you will think or you will behave in such a way. And so perhaps that's what it's like. And so they don't really need to read our thoughts. They need to know our thoughts as much as they need to maybe influence or even control, if they can, our thoughts. That's really what they're after, and what they're desiring. They don't need to read them. They just need to control our thoughts, if they can. I've mentioned before, fun fact, right? I wrestled from elementary school to high school. In high school, uh, our team, my junior year, we won the state tournament. Kind of a big deal. But... <laughs> One of the things our coach drilled into us was if you can control your opponent's head, you control your opponent. And what he didn't mean, you know, you got to be some kind of uh, cerebral assassin or anything like that, right? You just need literally to control your opponent's head because wherever their head's going, their body's going to go there. The body's not going to go where their head doesn't go, right? You control your opponent's head, you control your opponent. And so we worked a lot of short offense, front headlock control and all that. But here's the thing. I think the devil knows that, too. That if he controls your head, he can control you. That is, if he can control your thoughts, he can control your life. And this is why Paul here, as we circle back to 2 Corinthians, is so emphatic. Look, we have divine power. We have spiritual weapons to wage the spiritual war that have spiritual power, even God's power behind them. And guess what? These Powerful spiritual weapons of spiritual warfare are able to destroy these strongholds in the mind. Arguments, lofty opinions, stuff that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Who doesn't want you knowing God? It's the devil and his, his minions. And so they will set up these strongholds. The good news is, in Christ, we have everything we need to wage warfare victoriously in our minds. That's why it's so vital that we love God with all our mind. We exercise our mind through spiritual disciplines like reading Scripture, memorizing Scripture. Listen, you want to combat falsehood and error and lies? You need to know the truth. And when you know the truth, it'll set you free. When you know the truth so well, you'll be able to spot error and lies and falsehood miles away. It's for the mind, brothers and sisters. And we need to apply Christ's victory to our lives by applying it to our minds. Now when these accusations, these false accusations, rear their ugly heads, 
we combat them with the truth of Christ's victory over the father of lies and over the evil one and all of his kingdom. And that's where true freedom is. Let's commit this to prayer. Sovereign Lord, I believe that there is a brother or a sister, maybe several of my brothers and sisters, who are they're hearing this lesson. They needed to hear this lesson because they are going heads up against the accuser. I want to pray right now, Father, that by the authority and in the name of Christ, you would silence the voice of the liar Silence the voices that are speaking these false accusations to their heart, to their mind. And I pray, Father, that you would give them peace of mind through the glorious gospel of Christ. Indeed, Father, that's what we need. It is the glorious victory of Christ over the cosmic spiritual forces of evil. And so we say, your kingdom come, your will be done. Come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha. In Jesus' name, amen. That song reminded me of this text in Zechariah 4 and verse 6. The angel was talking to Zechariah. He said to me, This is the word of Yahweh to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says Yahweh of hosts. And that, that really is what it's about. Not by power or by might, your power, my power, our might, any of our human strength, but by the spirit. It will take spiritual power from the Lord of the armies of heaven in order to uh, gain the victory. It really is his battle. Well, I want to thank you for joining us this evening. Glad you could be here uh, for our Wednesday night midweek Bible study and our, also our continued COVID-1900 campaign. We do that every night, 7 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time, 1900 hours. We go live on uh, the Davis Park Church of Christ Facebook page and some nights on the YouTube channel as well. And we pause and we pray for those who are affected by and afflicted with the COVID-19 uh, coronavirus. And so we'll be back tomorrow evening for that. Uh, again, at 7 p.m., 1900 hours. And I think that's going to do it for us tonight. That's, that's all I've got. Again, thanks for joining us. And now the Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious. May God richly bless you, my beloved siblings. Till next time, God bless. Good night.